Hi, everybody. My name is Suzette Martinez Standring, and I want to welcome you to How to Create Outstanding Content. And for me, it's a real thrill to be able to reach the microphone. <laughs> I've been fiddling around with this thing going up and down, so anyway, bear with me on that. Um, I want to say that my forte is writing. I don't really understand words being bandied about today, like gradients and things like that, but I'm here to share with you some what I feel are very insightful techniques, strategies, and tips for making your writing stand out to your reader. Now, I'm a columnist. I'm nationally syndicated for a uh, spirituality column with Gatehouse Media. I've written these two books that are used in journalism courses, such as Mark, Hop Mark Hopkins, um, uh, Johns Hopkins University. And uh, I've, these books contain the best writing advice from Pulitzer Prize-winning columnists and other award-winning writers. So when you talk about business blogging and you're trying to apply that, I would say that what all of those kinds of things have in common is the art of persuasion. You're trying to persuade your client or your customer or your reader that they need to come to you, that you are the go-to resource, and you're going to be able to do that with content. Now, I've written all kinds of different columns, opinion, humor, lifestyle, and it is the art of persuasion, which means it's about relating to your reader. Earlier, that great workshop by Amy G, um, CQ, I felt that uh, it was so valuable when she said, it isn't about you, it's about them. And it really speaks to universal resonance. Maybe you have a particular pro product or a particular niche. However, it really speaks to the universal experience of anyone who might need it, no matter what it is. Now, I'm going to be speaking along the lines of writing, and I want you to take these tips and apply it to your business writing. Think about it in terms of your business writing and blogging. So John Avlin of the Daily Beast and a commentator for CNN said, these are the three things that stand out for columnists, for bloggers. Expertise, a strong voice, and social media savvy. And so I want to talk about, for a moment, expertise. Obviously, you're in a particular business because you consider yourself a go-to resource or, a, or you want to stand out in your field. So you're coming from a place of authority. And so you want to be able to convey that when you write about something. Now, a strong voice means a strong position. Now, you may notice in many, uh, me among many types of columnists, they have uh, a very notable personality. Maybe you agree with their position, maybe you don't, but you read them. Sometimes they will spark controversy, but they take a strong position. Now, for all of you, maybe you're not doing um, necessarily products or a business, but maybe you're trying to further your writing in some way. Well, you want to you want to be strong and authoritative in what you write, and that means good reporting. Keep in mind that your readers, whoever they are, and in the field that you're in, that they're coming to you, want to understand the world around them in some way. They want to understand how something is done or why they even need you. And so therefore, when you're trying to relate on a business level, you, you, you kind of want to take off your business authority hat and you want to relate to your readers as a person. And the best way to do that is to evoke emotion, to have the reader relate to you in some way. To be able to, for the reader to say, well, I get that. I, I know how that feels. I have this situation in my own life. Uh, like, for instance, websites where uh, healthcare providers you know, that are uh, operated by healthcare providers or people who are offering caregiving services or something like that. 
Yes, you want to know you're going to a professional, but at the same time, you want to know that they relate to you in even the most small, in the, even in the most minute or smallest of ways. You know, we all have concerns and things that are going on in our lives that we want to feel that someone understands and has a solution. Good reporting sets a column apart. And what do I mean by that? Well, obviously, you're not journalists, or maybe some of you are, but how does that relate to you and your business blogging? It means giving facts, research, maybe new information that is not easily found elsewhere. If you're blogging in your particular field, you might, and you want to set yourself apart. Well, are there studies having to do with what you, what you do or what you operate? Are there, are, that could be conveyed to your reader that makes them feel like, this is really something I need. Um, and so that's one of the things that really sets a good blog apart, reporting, coming up with some new facts, new statistics or research, making yourself the go-to resource in your field. Now, Ellen Goodman, many of you may know her. Uh, she's a very famous columnist, and for years she was blogging, uh, she was a, a columnist. Back in the days, back in the days in the 1960s, uh, she worked for Newsday when men did all the reporting and women did all the research. And when the women's liberation movement came along, she was one of the first to take that grid over women's lives and be the person who deciphered and explained what was going on for us, for women, and correspondingly how that related to men and families and all of us. Now, what does that have to do with your business? There are so many aspects of late-breaking uh, research in technology, in healthcare, in family, in caregiving, and many people are trying to find out, what does this mean for me? How will this affect me? So Ellen Goodman did a very powerful job of affirming experiences, making people feel like you are not alone. And how did she do this? She was a good listener. When I interviewed her for my book, The Art of Opinion Writing, I remember asking her, what do you think is the single greatest element of your writing long-time success? I thought she was going to say an incredible Rolodex of resources and experts. I thought she was going to say uh, great writing skills and journalism. She said, I'm a good listener. I have my ear to the ground, and I hear what people are concerned about. And that's what you have to do in your business. You have to be a good listener. You have to be able to know what are the new things that are going on. Think outside the box. What, in what way is your product or your industry making an inroad in ways, in novel, fresh ways that hadn't been thought of or explored and you could write or suggest or have people examine that with you. Now, I'm, I have here a, a slide about the lifestyle column, right? The lifestyle column for many of you are the columns that have to do with personal life, family, you know, and that can encompass all kinds of opinion writing, too, because let's face it, Ellen Goodman once said, the personal is political. And so lifestyle can be any aspect at all of life. In what way does it relate to daily life? Now, you want to be able, in some way, always keep in mind the universal subtext, which means universal resonance. And for you non-writers in the world, it really means what's in it for me. And I'm going to give you an example. Uh, a woman once wrote about um, parachuting out of a plane for her 60th birthday. Most of us will never want to do that, right? So we're not necessarily going to relate to that but we will relate to the feeling of doing something big once in our life. We do relate to the sense of adventure. 
We do relate to the curiosity of, wow, what was that like? So that is the subtext. Whenever you're writing and you're trying to engage your reader, what's in it for them? You may be writing about your father or your mother, but you want to write in a way that the readers will say, wow, that was my situation. I can relate to that. And when you're talking about business, the art of persuasion is persuading them that first and foremost, you're a trusted source. You are a friend. You are someone they can relate to. And so you want to keep in mind the universe, how does it universally resonate with your readers. And um, also, ask yourself before you write, what is the one thing you want your reader to take away? Do you want them to take away the feeling like, wow, I've got to try that? Or do you want them to walk away saying, I never thought of it that way? Or I never knew that. If you can do that with your writing, you will have achieved success. Because everybody, if they're going to invest any time at all with you, they want to feel like they've taken something away. And the lesson is very, is very important. Oftentimes when people blog, it's almost like a throwaway. Well, this happened to me. Well, great, that's happened to you. But what does it mean for me? What am I taking away from it? So you want to keep that in mind. You know, oftentimes when I'm teaching writing workshops, people often say, I don't feel qualified. I am not an expert. I don't have a credential. Well, here's the good news. You're here because you like to write and you want to learn how to write better. And here's the good news. You don't have to be the, the final expert on whatever you are writing about. You just have to know who they are. And you might want to feature them on your blog or in relation to what you do as a business. You know, oftentimes experts and professionals are brilliant, but they do not know how to convey their brilliance in everyday language. They don't know how to relate to an audience and get them thinking in ways of, hey, this can help you out. This could improve your life. You might be able to help somebody with this. And so therefore, if there is an aspect to your blog that can use an, a quote from an expert or an insight, find that person in your community, whether it's a hospital or a, uh, a, 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 a psychologist or a school or a university or whatever, a technology expert. Find out the point that you want to make and then get a quote from them to bolster your case. And not only will it make your blog more interesting, but it will show readers that you are a professional and that you take facts and research very seriously. Kathleen Parker of the Washington Post, most people are familiar with her, she once said, to stand out in the herd, you have to say something. Think hard and see what you have to say and say it better. And here's where I'd like to throw in 500 words for a column is ideal. If you're going to do it, now, there are much shorter posts. I'm not saying that you have to do 500 words all the time. But I think that if you are going to offer something substantial to your readers, try to do it in 500 words or less. Not only is it easy on the eyes for the reader, but you might be able to get that same kind of blog carried in a newspaper or a, pu or a digital publication of some kind. Uh, because the, you have to remember that you as a writer are always competing against breaking news or uh, attractive advertising or a sexy headline over here. And at any moment, the reader can break their concentration and go away from you. So you want to be able to hold on to them. And the way you're going to do that is, again, with make them feel something. Open up your blog with a statement that will shock them or make them happy or make them laugh or relate to them nostalgically. Make them feel something when they read that first line. And let them know up front 
what is this column about? Because people don't really want to read four paragraphs into it to figure out the point of what you're saying. Tell them up front what they're going to get from this. Um, and the other point I want to make, and many of these things are covered in my books, but I'm going to make them very quickly because we have a very short time today, is you want to write with five sensory zest. And by that I mean try to hit on all five senses when you're writing. You want them to see what you're talking about. You want them to imagine what it sounds like. If it's imagine the feel, you know, tactile, you know, sensual, whatever applies to your business. You want to be able to bring them into that scene and keep them there with you. And when you do that, you will have been very persuasive. Now, one of the things that I want to talk about is evolution of a niche. Maybe your blog, let's just say, it might be about uh, caring for a sick elderly parent. Let's pretend it's something like that, okay? It starts out being very, very personal. And eventually, it turns into something different. And I'm gonna give you, and I just wanna give you these two quick examples. It may or may not apply, but I want you to kind of expand your thinking of what you might be able to do with your blog or increasing or expanding your own business. You know, Joanna Weiss of the Boston Globe, you know, she started off as an entertainment critic. And she always had a love of entertainment, theater, film, and politics, and eventually she ended up, now she's a columnist, and her whole focus is pop culture as it appears in politics. She will bring together what's happening with the Academy Awards and connect the dots to something that's happening in the legislator, legislation. And so it becomes very entertaining and very accessible to a lot of different people, and it broadens her base. Do you see what I mean? You might think about doing something like that with your business if it, if it applies. You know, Robert Kohler with Tribune Media Services, he started off as a single dad talking about what it was like to raise a young daughter when, uh, when his wife died. And eventually, he segued into being a peace, a peace journalist where he talks about um, the military the propaganda of war and things like that. Very, very different things. Now, all I'm saying with regard to you is you don't know where your blog and your business may take you to. And you want to think outside of the box to all the various platforms that writing might open up for you. Now, I think that when I, when I interviewed a number of Pulitzer Prize winning columnists for my book, The Art of Opinion Writing, many of them took very different approaches, many different types of subjects, but one thing that they had in common was a mission. If you asked them, what was it that fueled their longtime career, they all had a particular mission. Ellen Goodman felt that she was the voice of women for a long, for a long in most of her career. Connie Schultz felt that she was the voice of the uh, blue collar worker. So you have to ask yourself whether or not you are doing, it's a business of t-shirts, there has to be some kind of mission that fuels your passion. There has to be something that sustains you during the tough times. And whatever that is in your business, you want to be able to convey that to your customer base or your clients. They have to know that you're really passionate about something. And oftentimes, you can do that with a personal story. I know that we're talking about business and you want to talk about your product, but you are the product first and foremost. People have to relate and understand who you are and feel that they can trust you in order to refer others to you. And they will do that on a personal level, which means you've got to give a little to get a little, meaning you've got to open yourself up a little bit to be perhaps vulnerable or heartfelt or informative or whatever it might be. But your customer base relate, you cannot put too small a value on relatability. 
The tipping point for many people is, well, I really liked her. I've done that so many times with business, with business people. Someone may be incredibly credentialed, but I'll go with the person I really liked. Of course, you know, with trust involved and all of that. Now, Connie Schultz, is, as I said, she's a, long, she's a Pulitzer Prize winner. And these kind of things also apply to you as the business blogger. You have to believe in your vision and do not allow others to define you. Which means, if you're in a particular business, maybe there is the stereotype, but this is how it's done, this is the way you should appear, this is the what you should cover. You should try to let go of that and do not let others define you. Decide why are you in the business that you're in? What aspect of it, of it is new and novel and exciting and that is not presented that way elsewhere? Because the worst thing you can do is march in lockstep with everybody else who does the same thing as you do. That's how you have to stand out. And it takes a lot of courage and bravery. There's no doubt about it. Now, at times, veer away from your typical writing style. And I want to very quickly give you some ideas on how you can do that. Let's say you're blogging and it's all first person. Your experience, what you see, what you found out. You want to mix it up a little bit. You want to write third person, write about somebody else's story. Tell, tell the story of, of someone through their struggle or through their failure and eventual triumph. And may I add, readers learn more from struggle and failure than they do from triumph. I think that sometimes people feel, well, if I don't say all positive, successful things about myself, that people will think I'm a loser or that I don't know what I'm doing. Well, I would suggest that the most effective writers have shared their failures and what led to their success. People love the underdog. People love stories of perseverance and endurance. And I'm sure all of you have gone through that. And that might be something you want to share. Um, you want to, and, and that's part of veering away from your typical writing style. Um, having a column in print is not important, and I, I guess that doesn't really apply here because you're all bloggers. But keep in mind that many good bloggers are now attached to new, online newspapers. Now, online newspapers have a thing about they don't really want to advance advertising, free advertising. But if you write in such a way that makes you a resource and an authority or an expert or you're constantly featuring experts or new information and you're informative, yes, you do this, this is your business, but the blog offers great information to all consumers, you stand a chance of being attached to an online publication. Now, this is something, you know, Mike Masterson, I, I think sometimes we get so involved with business that we forget that character really plays such a big part in what we do. People go to you because you have integrity, because they care about you, because you, they sense that you care about them, that they can trust you. That's huge, that's huge. And so, you know, these, these um, sayings, quotes by Mike Masterson, what we stand for during our limited time, amount of time here, rings forever through eternity. Tell the truth, let the chips fall where they may. Predictability is the kiss of death. These are things that have really fueled his writing success and decades of a faithful readership. But you could apply those things to yourself in business. You know, what do you stand for? What is your mission and purpose? In what way does your product or your business or your career translate to a life purpose? If you can make that leap, people will feel that in your writing or in doing business with you. Tell the truth, let the chips fall where they may. 
sometimes people want to, um, you know, kind of skirt things. They don't really want to talk about the bad things. But, you know, if you're writing for the consumer, you have to tell them what, what the downside is, what they might run into, you know, and, and, and perhaps improve it within your own business. But let them know. I, I love those kind of um, articles or their blogs where people not only tell me good things, but what you should look out for. That is so helpful to me. Um, and predictability is the kiss of death. Again, when you're doing any kind of blogging, change it up. Surprise them. Maybe one day you're going to write something funny. Maybe the next day it's going to be this killer research statistic that is going to surprise them. But, you know, change it up. You don't want to be predictable because as bad as it is not to blog regularly, because you kind of drop off the face of the earth, just as bad is to be very predictable. So, again, a fresh angle. Always be thinking about that. Um, what is a new and different viewpoint that you can bring to the reader? Or in what way can you personalize it? And I'm going to give you an example. If you're writing about childhood obesity, let's pretend, okay? Um, what, and I'm making this, these statistics up. One in every ten children is obese, and by the time they reach the age of 20, studies will show that they will suffer from this, that, this, and that, and this, that. Okay, well, that's pretty bland. That doesn't really evoke emotion. It doesn't. Maybe it should, but it doesn't. What is more compelling is little Angela is 10 years old, and 50 pounds overweight. Every morning at school, she is in the nurse's office crying from the taunts and criticism. The school nurse says, you know, interesting kind of quote, and you go on. People are invested in stories. And everything that you do, no matter what it is, there's a story to it. And that's really what you want to tell. And that's the most powerful way of engaging your reader. Find the joy of what you do and know that writing gives you a way into other people's lives, especially if you interview people or um, feature them in some way or their story. It's a, it's a window that people are always interested in. And very quickly, when you write a blog, what is the point of it? If I were to ask someone here, oh, so what's, what's today's blog post going to be about? I probably will get a 15-minute lecture on, well, you know, when I was 10 years old, this happened to me, and I started to think this. Uh, can you explain that in one sentence? Because if you can get to the point of what your blog post is going to be, you will be much clearer in the point you're trying to make to your readers. Because digression is the enemy. It's so easy to go off on 16 different tangents and make a 1,200 word post when really the point that you want to make can easily be done in 500 words if you know what you want your reader to take away. So think about before you write, do I have a clear point? What is it? Very importantly, who cares? Too often people have an idea, but is, are there enough people to really care about that, that post? So you want to think about, in a wide readership, the universal concern. And is there substance? Are you simply saying, well, I feel this, or I feel that, or that happened to me? Or are you offering a fact or a fresh new perspective? Think about making it significant. You know, new journalism. Let me very quickly summarize that for you. When you're doing a story, 500 words sounds really short, but trust me, this is what I do for a living, and you want to set your reader in the scene. So you want to can kind of construct the environment. Let put them in that room or put them in that situation. Use dialogue, whether it is what the person you are writing about says or the quote of an expert. Break it up with dialogue. And, you don't, and when you're saying the person is like, let's say, oh, the, the man was rich, 
You know what? Show it. Say the glint of his Rolex. There are telling details that say the same thing without the bland, common words that we often use to describe people. And emotion, again, figure out how do you want your reader to feel? What do you want them to take away? And how do you want them to feel? And take that into your blogging with you. Um, this is very important, self-revealing versus self-absorbed. We all write from the perpendicular pronoun of I. And that's a pretty scary place to write from. And so if you do that, you want to make sure that you're honest with your reader. You want to be vulnerable, and you want them to be able to relate. And very importantly, you have to let your reader draw their own conclusion. Yes, you are leading them in a certain direction. Yes, it's all about the art of persuasion. But you don't want to end your column saying, and unless you do this, you're an idiot. You don't. That's not how it's done. Self-absorbed writing is when there are when there are a lot of you're defensive. You're already thinking about all the possible criticisms that are going to come up, and you're warding them off right away. And you're telling readers how they should feel. Nobody appreciates that. Readers, customers, want to feel like they came to their own conclusion. And again, what is the lesson? Are you just ranting? You're just venting, That's, there's no place for that. You want to have a concrete lesson. There has to be a solution or a resolution of some kind. Um, I'm going to, uh, uh, in, in the interests of uh, time, I want to focus on Anglo-Saxon versus Latinate words. The language that you use and the words that you use make a difference to the reader. Now, Anglo-Saxon, very quickly, is the language of rock and roll. And Bill Clinton uh, was you know, famously accredited for being able to be so approachable, right? Well, he, when uh, Clarence Page really uh, examined his speeches, he realized Bill Clinton uses a lot of Anglo-Saxon words. Those are short, hard consonant, single syllable words, because they are approachable, because they're easy to understand. And Latinate words are words of uh, multi-syllable, usually end in T-I-O-N, like legislation, you know, or culinary. They, they're intelligent words, they sound more educated, but they also have the effect of putting readers at a distance. It's more formal. So whatever your style is, be true to your style, but realize that the style that you use does have an effect on the people that are reading you. And, you know, I'm not gonna read it out loud, but you can kind of see here, hold on. This one. This is George Will, where he uses very kind of erudite speech, uh, Latinate, and then Anglo-Saxon. Now, here's an interesting thing. They did a study of Pulitzer Prize winning writers and what do they have in common? Very interestingly, they write on a fourth grade level. Does that mean that they are ignorant, kind of silly, simple, puerile kind of writing? Absolutely not. These are Pulitzer Prize winners. What they did, what they mean, is that they were using short one-syllable words. Easy to understand, easy to get your point across. So this is something you want to think about. Oh, oh, sorry, did you want to take a picture of that? <laughs> I'm here to serve. <laughs> All right. And very quickly, well, it may, may, not, it may or may not um, a, a, a apply to you, but hate mail, nobody likes it, but when you're blogging, let's face it, you're gonna get the blog. You're gonna get comments on your blog, and it's amazing how some people can be so mean-spirited about the simplest of things. So I'm gonna leave you with a couple of things. You know, Kathleen Parker said, my cure for hate mail, and trust me, she gets a lot. My cure for hate mail now is just to go to a mall. I walk around and think, now whose opinion in this crowd do I value? And that makes me feel better right away. 
And Stu Bykovsky, he's a Metro columnist. Oh, he gets a lot of hate mail because he's very, very combative and all that. And his little trick is he doesn't even want to give the haters the, the uh, satisfaction of knowing they were even read by him. So he sends this fake email out that says, thank you very much, but unfortunately, Mr. Bykovsky doesn't have time to read email personally. Thank you, the Daily News automated response team. <laughs> What I'm saying here is that if you're a blogger, you have to find a way to kind of overcome the critics, the judges, the trolls, and that will happen. And, oh, this slide is a little bit, is, is out of place, but when you're ending your column, it's often the last and most memorable detail, so you want to make it powerful. And think about how your column starts, the opening paragraph, where you're going to grab your reader with emotion and tell them up front what this is about. And you want to make sure that it ties in with the ending paragraph. Many times it starts off a certain way and ends somewhere else, so you don't really want that to happen. And it either has to contain a lesson or a novel thought for them to leave with, or it calls the reader to action. So right now I'd like to end, and I really would like to take your comments or your uh, questions. I will be in the happiness bar to talk to anybody. I do have some books, limited amount of books there if anybody's interested. But um, I want to thank you for letting me share in this very short period of time uh, what I feel is very important in writing. Thank you very much. <laughs> Questions? Going once. Oh, good. Was I really that clear? <laughs> <laughs> um, this, this may not be quite the sort of thing you had, you had planned on covering, but you mentioned having stories to, to take your point, and, uh, to, to illustrate your point, and I, I was thinking that that sort of has been, at times, some of the problems that have led to uh, journalists being fired over things like making things up. I guess I was just wondering, do you have any thoughts on any form of journalistic ethics as it applies to bloggers? Oh, well, I think that many bloggers consider themselves journalists, and they are, if they have integrity, if they're accurate, and they are reporting facts. I think that there is a blur between commentary and reporting. And I think that columnists can, are also reporters, because we talked about how you are uh, bringing new information, you're in reporting. So, but when it comes to commentary, you have to be very careful that you can back it up with facts. You can't just rant. You know, you have to be able to say what you believe and why you believe that. And that will make the writer stand out and gain credibility. Now, as far as the creating um, fictional characters, well, I think that all readers do not appreciate being lied to. Now, if someone doesn't want their name, you know, uh, publicized, that's one thing, and and, and you can uh, you can give them a, a name in quotations and make it clear to your reader that you are not giving the right the 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 real name. But as far as creating composite characters, no, you cannot do that. You can't do that. You can't say, well, it tells a better story if I give them these kind of personalities and makeup that they said this. You know, you might be able to get away with that, but you're not supposed to do that. And the first time you get found out, you, you're in trouble and you lose all credibility and readers won't go to you. And the whole point of this is to, to create yourself as a go-to resource. I hope that answers your question. Anybody else? Any questions with regard to a particular field of blogging or business or? So my challenge is a little different. I'm, I'm a writer for many years and I'm in technology. Ah. 
how do you encourage my one of the challenges that I'm dealing with is how to encourage the technical people that I'm dealing with to start blocking about to start blocking about their areas of expertise. They are not writers, and they are pretty afraid of writing. So, any words of wisdom on how okay. to encourage people to start blogging? Okay, so his question was, how do you encourage people in technology to blog about their particular area of expertise when they are not writers? Hire people who are. <laughs> you know, sometimes, I really feel, again, it goes back to some of the most brilliant people are not writers. They know what they're doing. But I would suggest that Perhaps you can get your tech people to think about how they have helped someone with a particular problem and write about that. Because to talk about, let's say, to write about this word I heard today, gradients. <laughs> you know? But you might think that's a little difficult for you know for the average reader. But I I love the kind of technical blogs, uh, especially about technology and, and, and the medical field, where you take a person who had a problem and you talk about it in plain language and how this application helped them. And you use everyday language. And that is the best way. And here's another thing that might help you. Question and answer. That's a very effective form of blogging. It's an easy way to do things. And many columnists start off that way, especially people in education, where there are so many questions about particular aspects of a field. Try a question and answer blog. You know, reach out to your readers and say, what are you having a problem with? You know, what, in what way can I solve this for you? And, you know, in the beginning, you might have to make up some questions to get people going, but that's a really effective way to get started. And it's not intimidating to the writer because all they're doing is answering a question. Does that help? Anybody else? This is more of a comment on what you just said. Uh, I heard in a screenwriting workshop some years back that all writing is a process of asking questions and writing the answer. Yes. And as a technical writer for several years, I found that it's the greatest way to focus, to say, what is this product? What does it do? What does it do for whom? Why would anybody want it? And just put these things up front, and so many are so passive. If they're not told these things, you don't include them. And it's, it's, being a journalist is the who, what, when, where, and why. That's, I found, the best identity. Mm -hmm. You're okay to start ignorant, but not remain ignorant. What's your name? Uh, my name is Marsha Shandler. Oh, Marsha, thank you for sharing that, because that is really important. You know, she was talking about the who, what, when, where, how, and why of journalism applies to what you can offer to your readers. And it's often not, it's often not addressed. I mean, for myself, um, I don't even know, sometimes I don't even know that I need something until someone says, this is a common problem, and this is how we have solved it. And too many times, consumers are embarrassed because they feel like somehow they should know more than they do, but they don't, and they're too embarrassed to ask. So you might even think about asking your friends or acquaintances in your field, uh, not even your outside, way outside of your field. If you had a question, what do you think is the biggest problem or issue, or what do you think you don't know that you'd like to find out more about? And write about it on your blog, because that's who you're trying to appeal to. Any other questions? Oh, that's it for the questions. Thank you, everybody. Maybe I'll see some of you in the